Welcome to the Muslim Signal podcast. I'm your host, Konstantin Tuonihovi. We are thrilled to introduce our special guest today, Richard Gavin. Originally from Canada, Richard is a renowned author famous for his works where the uncanny and the divine intersect. His critically acclaimed horror stories have been compiled in numerous books, including Grotesquery, Sylvan Thread, Tales of the Pastoral Darkness, and at Fierce Altar, just to mention a few. Gavin's writing serves as a testament to the great masters who once crafted grand stories and as an evidence that they shall do so again, remarked Thomas Ligotti himself. Ricard's non-fiction work also embellishes the pages of several journals, including the popular Rue Morgue magazine and Starfight journal, as well as Clavis' Journal of the Occult Arts, Letters and Experience. His books such as The Benighted Path and The Moribund Portal, Spectral Resonance and The Numen of the Gallows have earned acclaim for their exploration of non-fiction esoterica. His latest book from Theon Publixing is The Infernal Mask. So, warm welcome to F- Europe, Finland, Ricard. It's practically already summer over here in the north. How are you this spring day? Are there any new projects you are maybe working on? Greetings and thank you very much for having me. I'm constantly working on new projects, small and large. So yes, there's always I've always got a few irons in the fire. That's nice to hear. I think it's uh, worth mentioning how we discovered you here at the Tuonenporti Collective, which is roughly translated the Netherworld Gate. It's uh, probably no wonder that it happened via a strange set of synchronicities back in late 2020. I had just discovered an occult black metal band, Aklus, and was so intrigued by their music and underlying deep esoteric themes that I decided to research and found the band's frontman, Nas Alkamet, who will be our next guest interview on Bardo Methodology magazine. He talked about his dream work, sleep paralysis experiences, and related subjects, which I recognized immediately. The more I read the interview, the more I became fascinated. Then he struck a truly deep chord in me when he said, for more on the subject of dread in the metaphysical experience, I would refer any readers to the esoteric works of my friend, Richard Gavin, which is exactly what I did and what the discovery it was. That's so, wonderful. I really appreciate that. And I, I appreciate NASA's support. He's uh, he's an amazing artist and, and definitely really has a keen, innate grasp of a lot of the topics that we're going to explore today. It seems like in the world of occult black metal, Achilles is the pinnacle. I have, I have been into black metal for some 30 years now. And it seems like there is, of course, like a multitude of um, esoteric or occult black metal bands today. But Atlas is really in a league of their own. The music, visionary themes and lyrics, it's, it's just like the whole package is uh, top quality. I have never experienced something like that before. So, and it, it was so interesting that now when I did that research, I found you and uh, there was another highly interesting subject, this concept of sacred horror, which we are going to introduce a bit later on, that it seems like these things are just uh, interconnected, as you well, very well know. Absolutely. Yes, I would certainly agree with that. It's like a rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you go into it, it, it will never end, I assume you. <laughs> but uh, could you tell us a bit about your background for our listeners? How did it all begin? How did you get entangled in the black mud of occultism, to ironically quote one Dr. Freud? Right. I, I do. <laughs> we, know, we, we share a quite similar history. Well, uh, you'd have to really go back to my early childhood. I would say if I had to pinpoint the impetus for this it would it would really be rooted in dream for whatever reason i i was a vivid and prodigious dreamer as a really young child and a lot of these dreams were horrific you know night nightmarish vivid lavish otherworldly dreams and what i want to stress in saying that is that these kinds of dreams are 
often dismissed by some as some sort of symptom of of trauma or a difficult childhood and that was not at all the case with me i had you know as close to an idyllic childhood as one could hope for so it was really there was always something about it that just presented this in, interior world or this other world that was within me that i could never really parse i was you know i was too young as i got a little bit older it, it, i began to feel a, an innate magnetic resonance with anything at all to do with the macabre the ghostly the frightening um and it's not that i was immune to the frightening effects of these of these films or these stories it was that they seemed to me to just have this this significance that even though i couldn't fully articulate it at the time they just became extremely important to me and i i i devoured as much as i could get my hands on and it was really just there was this strange urgency almost within this attraction that I had to all of this. And it became a complete source of fascination. And it was not long after I was getting, you know, anything I could get my hands on in terms of, of monsters or books about ghosts or, or, you know, old horror films on TV that I discovered just through public school that I had an innate talent to write. So right out of the gate as you know, early in my grade school, um, teaching, I was writing horror stories and found that I was able to achieve the kinds of effects that other artists had given me. I was able to produce those myself. So there was a great power in that. And that increased and deepened my understanding and appreciation. And as time went on, these fascinations and interests, of course, became much more philosophical i began to look at them a lot more deeply and really trying to um, assess because it seemed to me right out of the gate that there was something paradoxical about the world i was living in and many people experience this i don't i don't want to suggest that this is unique to me in any sense but that that paradox was an utter source of fascination with me and horror to me embodied and and gave this perfect vehicle to explore these kinds of themes um, and that was what i was able to do um, through writing and that is what eventually led me to explore things in in philosophy which eventually led into to mysticism and and occultism so that was really that sort of path so it was it was a gradual um progression and it became more sophisticated i suppose you could say and more nuanced um as it went along and since then it's just it's really been an amazing journey which as you said <laughs> just a few moments ago that there's really no end to it's just this kind of endless path that is constantly renewing constantly startling and that's really led me to where i am today that's absolutely uncanny what you just uh, told me, even though I know your backstory beforehand, but now that I heard heard it again and with uh, perhaps uh, new nuances, it's so similar to what I ha experienced in my childhood and what led me to this point in time when I'm interviewing you about this subject. It's... Well, you know, that's that. Sorry to cut you off there. I was <laughs> yeah. just going to say that that's. I, I I would be surprised by that, but but I am not because if there's one thing that I've 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 discovered over the years particularly as my work's been read and i've had contact with with readers and and done um you know just talk to people done interviews and so forth there's something innate to this this path this form of of you know spiritual exploration or or gnosis if you if you prefer that reaches back to those early days of childhood and it really has there is this sort of darker mysticism to it and I almost everyone to a one that I can think of that has, um, you know, ex reached out to me regarding the work that I do, they almost all say, I under I understood this, this was this was an expression of a childhood that I'm really, I can completely relate to. 
it's it's something you are born with it's not something you choose like uh, in your teenage years or whatever you know Absolutely. later in life you are born with it i completely agree and um it's it's so fascinating but uh, <laughs> in order to not uh, dive deep into them what we are going later on i think uh, this serves as a good introduction but nevertheless we can <laughs> we can move <laughs> on and uh, return here a bit later on let's talk about horror fiction because you are also known as an horror fiction writer i'll just uh, talk a bit about my own history with horror i was a horror a connoisseur from a very early age. Somewhat might say that I, I was too early to get introduced to horror, but it is what it is. And mm-hmm. uh, I, kind of, <laughs> I kind of just devoured everything I could get my hands on, and I mean a lot. And uh, in my early 20s, I kind of lost my appetite for the center. And I then just happened to found uh, Thomas Ligotti and his collection of short stories, Noxiori. And it, mm-hmm. it really opened a whole new world for me. And just recently, when I read uh, some of your novels from your collection at Fierce Altar, I found that there is this similar, almost surreal, visionary vibe to your stories, like in with Ligotti. And I, I refer your and uh, Ligotti's horror as a well-aged vintage wine compared to the vulgar moonshine produced for the masses. What do you think about this? Well. I suppose now it's my turn to share an uncanny <laughs> resonance. Um, yeah, I had the same feeling when I discovered Thomas Ligotti, and I was also in my early 20s. And it was it was an amazing experience for, one, the incredible literary quality of Thomas Ligotti's work. I mean, I, I think he is easily one of, if not the greatest practitioner of the form that's working today. And it was also what I found incredibly inspiring about it was that he was clearly influenced by the same gothic and classic horror fiction as I was Algernon Blackwood, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, going back to a lot of the gothic writers of the 18th and 19th century. And yet he was able to capture that flavor, but expand it into completely new themes and new environments and, and, and new plot structures so that really opened my eyes to the fact that it you didn't have to leave the classic horror behind um, in order to write something, as you said, that that's kind of more of a, a, a vulgar sign of the times type of horror fiction, that you could actually continue that that mystical or philosophical horror tradition. So I'm I'm always flattered and honored when when my work is is sort of placed alongside writers like Ligotti or or Blackwood or Lovecraft. Um, and yes, I definitely do try to create something that has a certain sense of the timeless, the eternal, that does broach a lot of the themes that my nonfiction does. Now, the caveat to that that I always offer readers is to, of course, not presume that what I'm writing in a short story is some sort of reportage of a literal event. Of course not. Um, However, I think the strength of visionary horror fiction lies in the fact that it stimulates both in the writer and in the reader that imaginal faculty, that sort of very subtle, rarefied organ of perception that many people have, if not all people. And this is what stimulates and orients them to this the sort of haunted world that we live in to the spiritual to this path that we've begun talking about and i see that as where they're interconnected so one with fiction it's seen as both a way to give context to principles that may otherwise be too abstract or too difficult for um, to convey through the written word if if so if one were to for instance try to write an essay exploring some of the the metaphysics of of nightmares or of of a haunted place and what that feels like um horror fiction is an ideal vehicle you can give all of the color the 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 taste the shading the the emotional spectrum can be invested in it to where readers can completely if not relate then they can at least comprehend the effects of that 
So in that sense, I do regard my horror fiction as spiritual work, as a, a form of both service and expression of my own impressions of the world. I think that's fascinating to hear. And it brings to my mind that the last interview I had with the well-known Finnish horror writer Marco Hautala, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about the same subjects that the real horror has to have this element of sacred horror or the numinous dread in, in order to have a spirit. And without that, it's just a, like an empty husk or, or it's some kind of like fear porn. If you think about the mainstream horror, what it is, it's yes. quite vulgar. Absolutely. And Absolutely. And I think that that's really symptomatic of a, a kind of obsession with the secular and, and yes. which, which is very much, an, in my view, um, an, an exercise in, in ego. You know, there is a tremendous sense, even, even in, in kind of, you know, nihilistic or, or strictly materialistic philosophies. I view a lot of that as rooted in just ego expression in people who who do not want to accept the fact that in this world there are experiences and and forces if you will a, a kind of in my view a, a world soul that is humbling it's awe-inspiring it can be frightening i think that is what informs a lot of this and when it's when you pull that tap root out of out of horror fiction and say well i'm just going to focus on whether it's you know uh, visceral gore or or you know the meaninglessness of life or or whatever it may be really that's that's essentially just you know it's just spinning its wheels and as you said you know an empty husk is a good way to to put it because it's not really ensouled in any way it's not really offering anything lasting whereas the some of the fiction that we've mentioned these are these can be life-altering these can be intensely uh life enriching these can open people towards the mysteries of of their own being definitely i still remember when i was <laughs> around 14 to 15 years old when i first was introduced to the works of hp lovecraft and mm. it really was a, like a visionary, almost psychedelic experience. I probably had read uh, some Clive Barker before and, and the usual suspects, of course. But Lovecraft was really, really something which kind of pointed the way towards something else to the other, so to speak. I'm, I'm a bit lost for words here because this is so fascinating. It's a good sign that when you, you when you get a bit stumbled with your words, you really know that some something has hit you. Yes, like, in, in a good way. Well, I'm glad to hear. I'm 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 honored to hear that. In order to stay on track, because I have a path where mm -hmm. it's in which we are on, and which goes deeper and deeper, like in kata basis, of course. I still need to ask you before we move on, how did you develop as a writer? I remember you started writing stories at a young age. Yes. Yeah, so it began really in childhood, as I said, you know, just doing just doing really small little tales, uh, primarily to amuse myself or sometimes for, for class assignments. Um, and it was through high school, I really decided that I was going to commit to becoming a writer. Now, whether that meant I was going to be a full-time professional writer, I mean, that's, that's sort of the, the adolescent pipe dream. I mean, you know, most, most teenagers think they're going to be musicians or, or, or painters or writers. And I definitely fell into that sort of naive uh, camp. But I, what I think what distinguished it was that I really was prepared to do the work and, and just dive in and, and learn my craft and accept the many, many, many rejections that came before I finally was able to sell my first short story for publication. And from there, it was really just, you know, working, working jobs, working in, in bookstores primarily, which is what I've done for most of my, my professional life and writing every day, committing to the process of just trying to improve, trying to get really less, it was less about creating quote unquote marketable fiction because even though it was a grand aspiration of mine to see my my work in print 
it was really less about any sort of commercial value or fame or, or money or anything that came with that. What I was really trying to get at was my own voice, was to find a way to really get at this core of me that I could trace all the way back to those early childhood nightmares that I could sense in in those early experiences and those early encounters with with the horror genre um and that that took a long time you know I'm st and it's still developing it's never anything that where you plateau and and sort of hit a, a, a static point of where okay that that voice is now crystallized and and this is who I am I'd like to think it's it's definitely there's there are recognizable traits through all of the writing that I do now, having having done it for so long. But I also am always just trying to follow the, this path that that is really, um, I guess, rooted in 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 the daemon or the muse, where I'm really just trying to allow that aspect to um, express itself, because in in a in a very real way. I do regard my writing as, as essentially a means of uh, almost automatic writing, almost received writing. I don't, I don't really have a claim to what I've produced through, through the images, whether they came through dream or through, through ritual or through, through trance states. Um, I can't claim a kind of egotistical um, ability that I've manufactured these per se. It's it's more of just allowing that voice to uh, express itself. And I'm simply there to facilitate. I'm simply there to try and make it as, as eloquent and as evocative as I can. Um, and that took a long time. That took many years it, that was running parallel with my own spiritual explorations and philosophical explorations. They were both symbiotic and, and feeding one another. And that's really how I, I trace my own development as a writer was um, finally reaching the point where I was able to convey it and, and thankfully have people, have readers respond to it positively. So that's, that's really the sort of origin of it. And, and I'm still, you know, I'm still in the midst of it. In no way do I feel that I have mastered anything. Um, in no way I, do I feel that I've, I've, completed this this work um it's it's ongoing and that that's something that does keep me inspired and and also keeps me humble it keeps me you know trying to continue to serve the that that greater force i suppose you could say um that is at work in in this type of of fiction that i do it's fascinating to hear that, that you are probably a mind reader or have the, some telepathic <laughs> <laughs> qualities as well, because you just answered uh, like a couple of follow-up questions I had in mind, mainly about, about visionary writing or visionary artistry. It seems like many of our ilk, so to speak, uh, share this uh, quality of visionary art in the sense that, for example, my, myself, I'm more kind of a visual artist mainly, but it in, in many of my works, it seems like I really, like you just said, I, I cannot take ownership of, of the art I produce because the daimonic influence is so important, you know. And uh, it seems like I know a lot of, not not a lot because it's we, we are quite rare, but I mean like my colleagues are almost all, they have this uh, visionary quality to them and they really understand that it it really comes from somewhere else, not your own ego. Absolutely, and yeah. you know when when you really just look at the history of all of the arts, their origins are all in the the sacred. They they were all in one form or another forms of a religious or a spiritual expression, and I know that that's um, ten, tended to be overlooked or or purposely forgotten in modern times because in the day and age we live in, everything's got to be commodified. Everything becomes a product. Everything has to be, you know, have a dollar value attached to it. And, you know, I'm, I'm not adverse to, you know, people earning money from, from, from their creative endeavors by, by no means. But I think that bearing that 
in mind, bearing the 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 sacred or the the spiritual nature of creation, is what produces far more authentic and engaging art. So I don't have anything against you know writers or painters or musicians or whatever form of artists who just really want to create entertainment. That's that's fine. There's room for that, but I I'd be lying if I said I had much interest in it. You know, it's it's not really anything that I find that compelling. Um, it's the artists who convey and and actively seek what we've been just dis- discussing that I find to be the most valuable and and the most impactful art. Yes, I I wholeheartedly agree. I can give you some examples when I have I have found some visionary works which have have been like a lightning bolt to my system, so to speak. For example, for example, uh, I think it was about a year ago, or maybe it was in the autumn. But nevertheless, I, I was at the cottage and I had this kind of a writer's block or some kind of um, I, I was a bit depressed or something, and mm-hmm. uh, then I just suddenly found out a quote by this um, Norwegian later philosopher called Peter Wessel Zaffe. Who, who was a great mm. influence to Thomas Ligotti. Absolutely. And, and to the True Detective TV series, the season one, of course. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it was some, some quote by, by this uh, bit obscure philosopher, which really struck a chord in me. And I was totally obsessed. And uh, I had just searched everything I could find on this, this philosopher. And uh, it was really like a journey with, with a rabbit hole, which brought me even deeper. And it was it was the same with Nas Aklus project and also Aratos too and uh, your works. When I listened to your interview, I believe it was with Hermetics podcast, mm-hmm. and I just I had to call my colleague and just rave about that there is this uh, author called uh, Richard Gavin, and uh, he has just like uh, I think Nas said that you had written down or used like actual words and concepts to decipher something I have all, always known. This is another suspect which I think you might get a lot. I, I'm very grateful to say that that I have, and it's it's extremely rewarding. Um, you know, because because again, I, I can't or or rather, you know, won't fall prey to that that sort of ego desire to think that I've, you know, I'm I've I've possessed or created some sort of uh, rare wisdom that no one else has ever thought of it's it's less that it's really more of when i began writing my nonfiction work when i began doing more works of esotericism it was to really give voice to these kinds of things because i had read a fair bit and explored quite a bit of mysticism and occultism psychology philosophy and I was finding rare works through that are, that were just sort of you know stippled throughout these these various traditions and and paths that really pointed to something that I wanted to articulate um, as holistically as I possibly could, and I think that's that's where a lot of that resonance comes in because there are people who who have this innate magnetism towards these kinds of things and it's it's i think it's just a way of of moving through the world of experiencing reality that is vitally important so i'm always i'm always honored to hear when people have been inspired by the writings and it's you know sent them on their on their own path it sent them on their own ways of exploring and expressing this thing I'm I'm sure, like you said, there is this current of, uh, how would you call it, like the sinister current, for example, or somebody mm-hmm. might have used a left-hand path or, or, or the crooked path or whatever, whatever the term. But I find it exhilarating that I have found actual like historical and mythological evidence which kind of backs up this thing I have been following my whole life. And uh, more importantly, I, I believe you are the, among the very few Western authors who have written books about this subject. And of course, this is a good leeway to your nonfiction works. For example, The Benighted Path, which some, somebody has called a manifesto. Do you agree? 
Well, you know, I, I had heard that term. I was I was a little bit uh, a little bit leery of it, only because manifesto is such a, yes. such a charged term, um, and it's it it's also has a you know certain degree of of uh, po- political overtones. But I I think I understood the spirit in which they um, describe the benighted path as being a kind of manifesto. So. I do understand the point, but as I said, I'm I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the the notion of it because it's it's less, um, you know, it, it's less a set of of um, concretized views as it is trying to inspire and and orient people towards aspects of of their own being that they may not have otherwise found articulation for. So in that in that sense, you know, it it is in a, a real way, it encompasses a lot of what I was trying to get at and trying to give a broad series of examples. You know, as as you mentioned, you know, finding these historical contexts was hugely, you know, ex- exhilarating and important because you know no one wants to fall prey to their own delusions or feel that they are completely isolated and don't really have a way to communicate this to to anyone else when you begin looking and realize that this way may not have been the more dominant way that humanity took however its origins go back to the to the beginnings of of civilization there have always been those people who have been drawn more towards you know the dark to the, the the perennial mystery and so really offering these various examples in the benighted path was my way of really laying out almost like a buffet of saying you know look you can go through ancient greece it's it's it was prevalent in in certain african tribes it existed in romanticism and in the ghost stories of you know the 19th 20th century it's it's prevalent in the gothic so really it's it was giving this broad overview that allowed people to see that there were many doors you know i i've often said that i i regard the world as as a giant haunted house and the doors to that haunted house are everywhere you know you simply have to find that that place that stimulates that that uncanny feeling and follow that through and you will you will begin this process so with you know with the benighted path as as the sort of initial volume in this it was my way of giving people the what i hope the inspiration to seek that on their own that it's it's less about my way of doing this and offering up all of these examples so that they can find their own way to further their own explorations of it could i just uh, rephrase that the manifesto part like this Uh, it came to my mind that perhaps the benighted path is kind of your signal to find the others and to help the others to find themselves if you catch my drift that's that is a a a great way to put it absolutely And I didn't um, mean anything negative. Uh, oh no, not at all. I didn't take it that way whatsoever. Yeah, it's just you know, it's it's that's the tricky thing with language is sometimes, even though the the word itself and and the use that it was uh, evoked in may be completely pure, sometimes terms are so saddled with so many years of you know overuse, misuse, misunderstanding. So I'm always really really careful in in my writing and and also when you know doing interviews like this to to just try to offer just that little bit of clarification so that it doesn't um, immediately spin into you know people with maybe preconceived notions about what a certain term may mean yes for example just to give a small example to our listeners think about the word ecstasy and what it means today and what it used to mean and we're definitely going to going to dig that deeper but I would say that they are worlds apart. The original etymological meaning of ecstasy and the hedonistic meaning people tend to associate nowadays. Let's talk more about the, the benighted path, primeval gnosis and the monstrous soul. And it was published by Theon. How did it come about? I know there's an intriguing backstory behind this involving Ludwig Klages, but uh, please share it with our listeners. Yeah, well, this is another fantastic example of of how yes. this this path seems to work you know how this how this mystery seems to manifest itself um 
it was through the writings of David Beth, who is um, one of the key figures at, at Theon Publishing. In his work, he had talked a lot about Ludwig Klages. And I, I admit, I was unfamiliar with, with Klages until his publication, and had, and which had some of the quotes from Klages' work in English. Um, I don't know how well known he was in the English-speaking world um, up until that point. But I really resonated with a lot of these quotes and the way that David put them in the context of describing night consciousness, which was a form of, of Dionysian intuitive um, expression, uh, a, a way of being that was that was not arbitrated or dictated by the intellect, by the ego, by our, our need to have everything following a logical progression. And that was completely resonant with me and it stuck with me for some time and I, re I remember thinking I would really like to write something that explores this concept of night consciousness and maybe broadens it from even the definitions that that Clogus had given it into something a bit more substantial and literally, I think it may have even been the same day, if not, it was, you know, a day or two after I had this thought. Um, I had been, you know, corresponding with with David Beth about various subjects. You know, we just kept in touch through through email. And out of the blue, I just received an email from him one day where he said, we're looking at publishing a study of night consciousness through Theon. And I thought you would be the perfect writer to do this. And that was literally, I, I took that for, for the, the portent that it was and, you know, was knew that this was absolutely the next project that I had to undertake. As daunting as it was, I'd never written a full book of, of esotericism before, um, but I knew that this was what had to be done because this was, it was just such a perfect synchronicity. And I always pay attention to those more so than anything where I am trying to architect you know, my career or my life, whenever these kinds of moments of strange, eerie synchronicity that, that, you know, kind of make the hair on the, on the back of your neck stand up, I always follow those through. And that was literally the origin of the book. You know, we went and it was about a year and a half long process of writing and going back and forth with Theon and, and, and it sort of developed from there and became the book that was published in 2015. I have heard this uh, story at least a couple of times before, but it's still fascinating, the synchronicity and the timing, the Kairos moment. Mm -hmm. It's it's really, I, I really know what you're talking about. And similar phenomenon has happened to me and my colleagues too. And you really need to be like on point when, when something like this is coming, when you hear it through the, when you put your ear to the train tracks and yes. you can hear it coming, you need to be ready or you will miss out a lot. And that's just it. And, you know, a lot of times it, it, it is these, uh, you know, that was obviously an example that was so uncanny that I had to follow it. But to your point, sometimes these synchronicities and these, these little portents that we get through our life are extraordinarily subtle. And that's why the concept of night consciousness, as I explored it in the benighted path was really, encouraging readers to hone their own faculty to pick up on these subtleties because the division between what could be called the you know the apollonian consciousness which is logic yeah. and 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 order and it's very constitutive it draws order and, and structures things now that's that is a vitally important aspect but that's one half of the human equation and i think my my issue with it is is less that it's you know, got to be eradicated. That's that's not the case. The problem is that the Apollonian mind is very, very appealing to the ego. And I think that those two things dovetail and they become really entangled to the point where, and we've seen it throughout history, whether it's, you know, the, the, the so-called enlightenment that happened, whether it's the secular materialism that dominates today, what ends up happening is rather than logic and reason um, being a tool in humanity's toolbox, it becomes the sole arbiter of reality. It becomes the one true and absolute God that we will not deviate from. And anything that 
is outside of what the intellect or the the rational mind can parse is just viewed as 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 folly or unimportant insignificant delusional primitive contrasting that though is this other half of each and every human being and that's the dionysian this is what's rooted in the subconscious in the instinctual in the the ecstatic drive to to breach boundaries and to transgress and experience that that which is hidden and that is really where night consciousness is rooted one would think that it's actually because it is such a potent force that it's that is simple to access but the reality is it actually requires a great deal of introspection self-testing you know real initiatory work because what this path is is extraordinarily destabilizing you know there's a reason why horrific imagery or gothic imagery is so germane to this to this current going all the way back through history you know the gorgons in greece typhon you know the storm the you know the ruined castle all of these all of these types of images that that people know it's it's just this almost genetic recognition that we've got we know when something partakes of the the, the dark mystery, the uncanny. And there's a reason for that. It's because it is a destabilizing force that disrupts the ego, that tosses the ego off of its throne. And for some people, that is that is absolutely what they what they are seeking. And they're the ones that usually gravitate towards my work and 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 the work of others that have influenced me. But there are many people that just simply don't want to let go. You know, they they do not want to remove themselves from the center of their own their own lives, or I should say, their concept of themselves as being the center of their own life. And again, this is where I there is that strong interconnection between the spiritual path and horror fiction, horror films, the uncanny art, surrealism, all of these types of things partake of this broader numinous force that completely challenges and confronts our logical perceptions of the world and so i think a lot of the drive of this path is to hone and strengthen and learn to listen to those very subtle cues of 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 your own spiritual reality of demonic reality and it's it's not always going to be the kind of blood and thunder effects that that one would expect. Um, it's often extraordinarily subtle. However, if followed through, if followed through with with deed, whether that is uh, you know fashioning a painting or or a fetish or a, a, a poem, once it begins to become concretized and 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 expressed given given a vehicle those subtle cues become more frequent and more intense and they lead one deeper down the path and that's really the i, I guess if i had to sort of say that's the underlying ethos of of my work that would be it this subject is utterly fascinating and you Again, you 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 probably <laughs> had used your telepathic qualities to read my script, my my, my next <laughs> questions. <laughs> it, it happened you know, again. It's, it's interesting. It's yeah, I was I was just going to say to add to that. What, what's really <laughs> um, interesting with these kinds of synchronicities or or sort of you know seeming you know moments of of, of precognition, I think a lot of it is because there is this um, perennial living reality to this thing and when you when you explore it when you partake of, of it when you engage in a discussion or an exploration of it with other people who have a similar ethos or a similar uh, sympathy to, and resonance with it it does begin to just kind of manifest almost on its own um, and that's another testament to to the reality of it you know, and we're seeing it, we're seeing it here today, you know, it's, it's, it's that, and that again is one of those things that I just, I always find it endlessly invigorating and, and fascinating. It really is. I need to mention this, I believe, I believe he's originally British, this uh, Peter Kingsley, 
He's an mm. academic and mystic at the same time. And yes. uh, he wrote this book called Dark Places of Wisdom, which I think would be very, very intriguing read for our listeners. I'm reading it currently, and I was urged by my Finnish um, colleague that I really need to read this um, book. And in the interview with you and Nas Alkamet at the Sol Knox podcast, it was called The Sacred Horror, the episode. I think it was Nas who mentioned this uh, same book which really taps into that division of, of like the original night consciousness and what happened afterwards in the ancient Greece. And, you know, w- just to interject quickly, without a <laughs> yes. word, without a word of a lie, I literally received my copy of that book last night. That is, oh. it's, it's literally within reach of me right now. So there's another perfect synchronicity for you. It really happens. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And- uh, you mentioned Apollonian versus Dionysian, and that was really in my in my script too. But uh, I, I wrote for my script. I, I'm quite proud of this bit of a visionary thought. Uh, I, I wrote uh, there is a battle between these forces, and it seems the former has unfortunately had a stranglehold over the latter for many centuries now. Do you see a change, a renaissance of night consciousness after a long famine? caused by overt rationalism? That's an excellent question and really well phrased. Yes, I think that there's a there's a renewed urgency, I believe, where people are starting to realize that this this intense reliance upon the Apollonian, upon the logical, has completely bled so much of the essence out of the experience of of being and what has always been most intriguing about the dionysian which is always a darker current a subversive current a lawless current is that it has been coursing through every culture and in every age so we can see it as as almost to use your your analogy of it being combative when you look at the gothic novel and the the rise of gothic literature that happened you know during the 18th century that was a direct backlash against logical positivism and scientific materialism that was essentially trying to dispense with the and any any notion of of a spiritual or a gnostic layer of reality and those novelists injected ghosts and hauntings and familial curses and barren landscapes and all of these these evocative images into that literature which was wildly popular in its day and 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 persists to this day i mean almost all of those major works are still in print and still read 200 years later and why is that because it is speaking and addressing and feeding this layer of of it, this vital layer of of the human condition you know and i think that where what people tend to dislike is just the notion that they are not in control and that apollonian consciousness the reason why i said a bit earlier that it appeals to the ego so strongly is because it essentially says that if you do these proper actions and you you know you follow these rules you can you can stay completely in control you'll be you will be safe you will be powerful you'll be you know rich you'll be beautiful this is this has run rampant in modernity we can see it everywhere i mean people live through the image of social media you know they 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 are obsessed with the the superficial glamour of their own life whereas seething underneath this is that current which when it is particularized in a human in the human organism in a human individual it's the subconscious um and this is the thing that will that will out in dream that will out in in certain um tics or certain behaviors certain neuroses because it is not being expressed it is not being faced it's not being integrated so the reintegration of that dionysian current 
will and you know it has to involve some fairly drastic means of self-expression and the irrational um, and that's that is why the the art as i describe it in in my nonfiction, does have so much of the the uncanny and the and the fearsome because that is i i truly believe that when the other is invoked and is given form and is given a face and leads to you know those moments of of horror and ecstasy and and you know exhilaration it is usurping that logical stranglehold on life and that that's that is the form of a kind of dark liberation that we see in in the dionysian mystery cults that we see in greek tragedy that we see in in ecstatic poetry and ecstatic art and I think that it is definitely becoming more, um, ex it, I think it's being explored far more deeply than it has in the past. And perhaps it is because there is this urgency, this sense of urgency where because the world has become so, so much a product of Apollo that people are really starting to realize that what it ultimately results in is not safety for that's just that's just simply the illusion of safety they are realizing that it is a, it is a half-life and that wilderness that true kind of pan-like form of nature which is completely imbued with spirit or soul is something that people are hungering for and are i think are awakening to and are realizing that it is not completely hopelessly remote it's not a product of the far distant past you know th the ancient can completely flourish in the present provided that an individual is willing to undertake the steps required to facilitate that to create an arena for that and that is where spiritual practice comes in you're absolutely right I think the individual the modern person just needs to like you said remove him or herself from the confined and the controlled space of rationality of the modern life and just kind of um, dive into the liminal. For example, when you are living in an apartment complex or whatever, you are living in the city, the trance of consensual reality, the most base reality defined by media and other people, you know, mm -hmm. the straight jacket <laughs> type mm -hmm. of uh, consciousness, uh, the day consciousness, when you are, for example, when you, when you go to the forest and when you go to the cottage or somewhere where everything is not defined and controlled, like, uh, for example, the Numinos device to be confined, like uh, I think a Canadian professor uh, John Verweg, he had these collections of courses and it was like awakening from the meaning crisis. He had a bit about Numinos and he referred to many interesting things, but basically he said that the Numinos really cannot be, I'm again lost for words, but maybe you can help me out a bit. It it, it cannot be defied, it, it cannot be confined, and uh, you p cannot uh, put uh, shackles to it. it, it completely outside it. It's the Ab other. Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, and this is where the wilderness nature is the perfect um, environment for this type of thing to happen because for all of the benefits and you know and I admit I have a conflicted relationship with modernity I, I rely on a lot of the conveniences as as everyone does however um, that doesn't mean that I accept it as being the pinnacle of of existence or that I, I regard you know the 21st century as as being some sort of glittering golden age of, of technological marvels no um, when you retreat into the wilderness, what you discover is you begin to realize that the modern world is completely human centric. It is designed to function as a sanctuary and a, a basically a bubble for all human endeavor. Whereas when you get back to nature, you quickly, very quickly will realize that the living planet is was not built for us you know we we are able to 
cohabitate to a certain extent, but that is where you begin to realize the scope of the planet, the scope of nature, and particularly when we have, um, when one has a, a, a spiritual connection to, to the wilderness, because in this sense, it's not even just the cycles of nature. You know, we mentioned the other, and I think that this is, this is a crucial point is that otherness speaks or expresses itself through nature. So in other words, the processes of nature, the environments of nature, they are catalytic. They're catalysts for this unseen presence, which is totally palpable. You know, people experience it. They, they, they will find it in, in a certain grove or a patch of woodland, and it will really give you a sense of this broad, very alive world that you occupy. And it is not one that was designed just to appease your likes. It doesn't work the way that you think it should work. Nature works as, as it does. It, it is a perfect functioning organism. And through that, that is where I think you can gain not just an intellectual understanding of, oh, I now see the, the value of this construct that we call otherness. No, it's a visceral, palpable experience. You know, it, is, it, it, may, it may be something that you can compute intellectually, but probably, more than likely, it will overpower the inter intellect. You will be immersed in that living moment. You know, I, I refer to it as a kind as a frisson or a shiver. It's that moment when the ancient expresses itself in the present, and and by the ancient I mean the the spirit, the soul, the the all the thousands of years of of the dead being revived in that moment, and you you suddenly understand your place in in this entire system, and that's crucially important and i think that you know as as you mentioned living in in cities exclusively will only i think lead to a, a, a form of, of madness i mean i think in, in, if you cannot reconnect with that and recognize that then you are going to be existing in this half-life that is going to cut you off from the very root of of, of what you are and that is that root is nourished in the dark. It's the subconscious. It's the wilderness, both within and external to oneself. It is the ecstatic um, reality that, and the reason why you know the ancients were so um, invested in it is not because they were superstitious. It's because they were living shoulder to shoulder with that that inhospitable wilderness every moment of every day. You know, it's it's as that chasm has grown as we've developed these cities and and created life patterns that are based on um, our own intellectual creations, it's removed a lot of the instinct. So, of course, a ghost or a, a, a genius loci is going to seem silly to someone who works in an office tower and, you know, takes the subway home and never has, you know, other than maybe seeing a, a patch of trees in a little parkland, has got no connection to what the night actually looks like when there is no light pollution. You know, what what the wilderness is when you're out there and, you know, your next meal is going to be dependent on your own wits. These are, these are the kinds of things that are tremendous portals to the kind of spiritual experience that we've, we've been talking about. Spoken like a true visionary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> poet. Yeah, it, it's really intoxicating to hear these words and uh, how eloquently you put it, put them. It, it really brings my mind uh, like uh, many many different uh, topics or um, sub paths, so to speak. But there is this one concept you have talked before, and I think you hinted to it just in your last speech. It's called darkness as potential. 
let me just uh, elaborate a bit further myself. It, normally, darkness is seen as a something like, for example, it's evil. It's 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 in a trite sense, gothic, not in the in the grand sense. And it's just uh, people might think it's juvenile. It's something people are so detached from. But you are talking about darkness as a metaphysical potential, something which is always there. It has been before the light and it has nothing to do with any kind of dualistic dichotomies of the modern world could you elaborate this further certainly yeah, yeah. um with the concept of of darkness as a a potentia yes it's essentially in in my experience darkness veils and also reveals the kind of inner significance of things and this can be a literal darkness as in you know if you're if you're out in in a natural environment at after dark and you can actually truly experience what the night is like minus light pollution and things like that that's one aspect it's also prevalent within oneself um when you allow free expression some people do it through through dance or through writing or painting when you allow that which is within you to be expressed, you realize that it is something that you stand back in awe of. You, you're almost a witness to it. And that really has, to a certain degree, to do with a kind of submission, in a sense, a, a, a giving oneself over to the mystery. And this is where I refer to it as potentia because it is it is a spontaneously expressing force in my view. It it really does present possibility and it it forces one to question and it really does veil our certainties of things, whether that is our identity, whether that's the environment that we're in, whether that's um something that we may not want to face about ourselves you know this is where darkness acts as an agent of truly authentic transformation and allows one to go further than they thought possible because again boundaries are if not completely obliterated then they are veiled they become somewhat obscured and this opens up to the liminal this is where the unseen or the potentia bleeds into the apparent and it's it's at that moment which is is you know again somewhat difficult to to accurately describe but it is a kind of pa living paradox a vital moment of paradox where you realize you know you mentioned dualism and i think this is where there's that fascinating non-dualism it takes effect where it's, it is both, you know, as I wrote in the Infernal Mask, I said that both, you know, beauty and terror are inextricably linked and they dwell at the heart of the sacred. So it's it's both attractive and and repellent. It's it's fearsome, but also extremely alluring. You know, it can be repulsive and and erotic. It can be overwhelming and yet deeply desirable. And it's living in in that moment of where you realize that that is allowing this potentia to express itself. This is what presents portents. This is what gives one keys to the mystery of, of, of their own path. And by seeking that out, this is what, this is where I think this, this type of spiritual path or practice differs from many of the other even magical or mystical or religious traditions in, in certain respects, whereas it's not going in and, and asking for what you want. It is not about what the self can attain or, you know, will, will this allow me to basically just become more powerful than I am now? It's submitting over to the process itself, which, again, paradoxically, will probably give you a greater sense of empowerment because it is something larger than yourself so i think in that sense this is what i mean by the darkness as potentia is not simply viewing it as well i'm going to cross the abyss and overcome all of these woes and miseries and and then 
I'm doing this because I want to transcend it and get past it to go to the other side because, you know, I have a goal in mind. It's not goal oriented. It's, it's allowing it to express itself. And this is, this is, I think the difference between a kind of imminence as opposed to transcendence. The imminence is right there. It is, it is that demonic reality that is presenting this in between this state, you know, it's, it's, it is neither wholly divine, nor is it completely earthly. It's, it's not totally infernal. It's this in betweenness, And that I think is what can be experienced when one views the darkness as something to be engaged with rather than overcome or avoided. Whoa, that was, that's really something it again brings to my mind many different topics but for example just to give our listeners some some idea for example the concept of scrying it involves to having this kind of black canvas where you mm-hmm. can visionarize things and it, it, it's also interesting that you said immanent versus transcendent this is something i learned from the i believe it was the sacred horror episode of soul Knox. either nas or you said uh, something about anti-transcendent did i hear it right yes, yes yes and i think like you know and this is this is um a point that i'll try i'll try and give a, a clarification on yes. um yes. in that it's it is not that there is a disregard for a a, a numinous spiritual plane far from it um i think where the concept of transcendence um for me it is just anathema to what i'm seeking is it becomes too much about a, a, a sort of singular goal a future goal a it's it's almost overlooking the now or at least um waiting for this this kind of moment where whether it's the body or the the material world itself can be overcome so that I can have this plane or this, this plateau of pure spirit. My issue with it is not so much with the notion of, of a spiritual plane. It is that in my view, it is intimately connected to nature and the flesh. Um, it's not totally reliant upon it. However, it, it is, there is a symbiotic relationship. And I believe that that is where, again, we we need to, if not avoid, at least be mindful of the fact of not falling into those kind of dualistic paradigms of, you know, well, I, I just want the spirit, not the not the matter. Well, the spirit is what, you know, it the spirit is what gives matter its meaning, just as, you know, matter is the expression of the soul or spirit. So Again, it's that kind of paradoxical symbiosis, and where, where I think my own view is, is that I'm I'm far more interested in a depth experience than I am a transcendent experience. I would rather, exp- you know, have the fullness that is both spirit and matter at once in a kind of dialogue, um, and so that's really my own view on it. This is really, really fascinating. Again, I, I believe I heard a term called uh, pandaimonic. Uh, does it refer to this, what you just told me? Is it connected? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because I, I feel that, you know, demonic reality is this, it, it can be nature, but it, it can also be in one's own environment. And it, it's it's where one feels that connection to the the numinous or the spirit um and everything has a kind of uncanny veneer to it you know there's 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 another in other words there's a there's a real sense of an unseen presence that is um palpable in one's environment and the other thing about it is that demonic reality much like nature is that it is destabilizing it is not beholden to our own wishes um it can be a really treacherous experience however 
it's that fullness of experience that I think one seeks because I, I, I believe that the path continues in part not because one either transcends or even fully hurls themselves into a demonic reality utterly and completely because either one of those I think is going to just cancel one's self out. It's a matter of delving and then integration, delving and then expressing and reintegrating. That's what allows one to go further. That's allow, that allows one to avoid pitfalls of, of both ego and also, you know, the very real dangers of, of delusion and madness or, or, you know, physical, physical calamity. Um, these, these are the kinds of things that one can um, mitigate provided that they are willing to have that process of communing and having that reciprocity with demonic reality, acknowledging that, you know, what they will be confronted with will probably be frightening, be destabilizing, be other to them because it will, it has to be other, you know, if, if it, if it is not, then I, I, I sort of question the, the validity of it. It may just be the contents of their own mind. Whereas the, the actuality of demonic reality is again, felt with this imaginal sense, this, this very subtle organ of perception that allows one to follow instinct, um, follow their own sense and to really, in a way, follow their own fear, you know, going to those, those places or those environments, undertaking the things that are frightening to them because as um, the archetypal psychologist James Hillman once wrote, fear can be a call to consciousness. You know, fear can be, or sacred horror in this sense, um, is intimately connected to the numinous. And when it is pursued in, in that spirit, that is what leads one to profound experience. Wow, this really is a, like a buffet. <laughs> I mean, like uh, there, there are uh, like a la carte menu, of course, but this is this is really like a, a good way to kind of hint uh, our listeners that what, what everything that is out there, that's like really like constellations upon constellations and stars upon stars. It's it's so fascinating, this this whole world. I just uh, try to keep us in the path because this is really like a pand pandemonic situation in the sense that we are really like in a whirlwind of fascinating themes and worlds. But you mentioned this uh, sacred horror, which is, of course, one of the most important topics or fields of study at, at the gate, our collective. And I think we can just uh, jump right into that to give kind of introduction to these themes. And you say, you have said that there are three forms of horror. And first is anxiety, second is panic, and third is the king fear, the sacred horror. And can you elaborate on this? Yes, absolutely. Um, to begin with anxiety, I mean, we see that this is a, a phenomenon that is predominant through, through the modern world. And I think that in that octave of fear, it's really a, a disconnected sort of fear. It doesn't really have a form or a face. It's a very generalized sense of unease that in many respects is, is largely, if not totally, uh, psychological. So it, and it's, it's an unfortunate thing. I know many people, you know, suffer from it. And I think that it is a, a kind of, a, a, a tremendous force that can pull one completely up into one's own mind. So in that sense, it's, it's a, it's a kind of closed system that that's a feedback loop. Panic is of course rooted to the ancient Greek God Pan. Yes. And this he, Pan being the, the pastoral God had many qualities that you can see are, are relevant to what we've been discussing here. Panic is that moment where I believe it was actually Algernon Blackwood may have written this, where it's, it's the moment where you are aware suddenly and, and 
usually hurled into a state of awareness that everything around you is alive. That is the moment of panic. This is something where it is operating at a, at a different octave than something like anxiety, because it is, is a force that is places one in a living environment. And it can be, again, utterly overwhelming and definitely destabilizing, but also incredibly beautiful. You know, you realize that this is a haunted see a place that is seething with life and it can be a natural environment it can be you know a room it can be if you're a, a person that you know does ceremonial magic or some form of ritual it can be your ritual chamber it is that moment when suddenly the soul or inner significance of all the forms around you reveal themselves through you know express themselves through those particularized forms so it's going back to that kind of darkness of potentia, that is when it takes a particularized form or many particularized forms and radiates through. So that is a, a true Gnostic moment. That is, a, that is a, in my view, an, a, an encounter with the numinous. Where sacred horror is one that I place at the top where it's related to, to, to dread, and I think, you know, they're all interconnected and I don't want to be too hierarchical, hierarchical about these, but sacred horror is cultivated. Sacred horror is when one is engaging with this deliberately and is understanding the inner or underlying significance that is profoundly spiritual in nature that, that fear offers. It's definitely connected to the theologian Rudolf Otto and his notion of the Mysterium Tremendum, where he, you know, basically said that any encounter with the divine, regardless of the, of, of whatever spiritual tradition one may be a part of, or no, no tradition at all, that numinous or divine invisible aspect of being is going to be met with awe and dread, usually in equal measure. So again, it's it's that concept I talked about, about beauty and terror being completely inseparably uh, entwined at the heart of the sacred. It's, it is a, an awesome and, and humbling experience that allows one to see that this is a, this is a Gnostic fear. This is a fear that is showing one that at that moment, at that moment of horror, revelation has occurred. There is a, one has gained either an insight into themselves or has seen an aspect of the world that they were previously ignorant of. In other words, it has broadened their experience. It has shattered the boundaries of their own preconceptions about the world and offered them a, a new and vital and palpable experience or encounter with reality. And that can be tended and cultivated. And it goes to what I was saying about following one's fear. It's, it's not about simply going out and just thrill seeking to where you just want to, you know, get good and scared. And, and, and that's the main goal. No, it's, it's following it because you are willing to test yourself. You are willing to go beyond your own, physical, mental, spiritual boundaries in order to encounter this, this demonic reality. And there's an authenticity to that. There's, there's a, you know, a true, um, humbleness, I think that, that comes out of that encounter because one realizes the vastness, you know, this path does not have a beginning or an end. It is ongoing and it is always startling and, and ever renewing. And by, by seeking, by consciously seeking those, those places or those themes or those images that frighten oneself in order to press past them and beyond them and look, look at what is staring through that mask of horror, what, you know, what is beyond that form, that particularized form that the numinous has, has assumed is what furthers oneself, is what can, is what Im, imbues oneself one's life 
with that kind of meaning and comprehension. And that's really, I think, the the essence of a, a lot of how horror and the the images and the and the motifs of horror relate to this this spiritual path. Again, this is this is just a splendid. It's um, I have never heard any, anyone so eloquently uh, explain the concept of sacred horror after Rudolf Otto, the, the a grand grand man him, him, himself. But uh, oh, I'm flattered. I, I really appreciate that. That that means a lot. Thank you. And could you um, have you ever thought that uh, because uh, after after like I said, Rudolf Otto and your, your work, I don't see that much talk about sacred horror in the modern occult or esoteric scene, so to speak. And maybe it's because of the humbling aspect. People who are <laughs> prone to egoism are not uh, that willing to get humbled by, by the true numinos. I believe there is no true danger of them ever even approaching it because it really it, it needs a certain faces and it needs a lot of work. And it need to you need to be prone to get yourself humbled in yes, the real. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think I'm I'm glad you, you you know you mentioned that because if there's one of the the issues I have with just occultism in general is that one, it it is often so deeply rooted in in ego, um, despite the fact that you know many people would perhaps argue that it doesn't. Um the, the other point is that there is this presumption, I think, that sodalities or, or you know, orders have a kind of proprietary claim on certain kinds of experiences. And in my own writing and in my own view, that is patently untrue. And what I often tell people is that you don't have to be an occultist of any description to pursue these kinds of things. People can be, have, have no particular spiritual affiliation at all. They could be Muslim. They could be Christian. They could, you know, it, it doesn't matter the particularized tradition. It can be found in all sorts of different um, guises. And it is also just extant in the world. It is, it is felt in the wilderness and things, things of that nature. So, yeah, where where I think it is is that it's, it is that willingness to to face it and also to confront oneself, and that, as as you had mentioned, is is something that few people will do if if they are simply engaging with things as a, as a way to cling to their own inflated sense of self. You know, I'll be totally honest with you. I the, the most vital and important things to me throughout my life my identity has had almost nothing to do with them you know writing it's my sense of self is is very rarely that important to me the the more meaningful experiences have occurred when i've forgotten my identity you know when when that has been eclipsed and overpowered by the kinds of things that we're talking about today and that's that's you know part of why I say that this sort of humbling power is part and parcel of this because in reality, those things that are products of my ego or that I have, you know, perhaps pursued consciously or not for more selfish purposes have rarely come to anything of, of lasting value. Whereas these, these pursuits have, and I think that's, that's a key point. Oh, oh, you're you're speaking about um, kind of the okay. I think uh, Mircea Eliade, the Romanian uh, mm -hmm. uh, researcher of religion, had sure. this concept of uh, sacred time versus uh, but what was the counterpart to sacred time? It was uh, not vulgar time, but uh, profane time. Profane time, yes, yes. yes. Uh, could you uh, do, or do you agree with me that sacred horror? The experience of the numinos uh, at, at its most extreme is kind of uh, like distilled or concentrated, electrified, uh, sacred time, if you catch my drift. Yes, ab absolutely. Time is such an important, you know, reckoning these things temporally rather than, you know, spatially or, or any other form 
is a great key to their significance because i think those moments that you mentioned those those kind of electrifying moments they are that sacred time where the ancient and the present and the now are informing one another they they're flowing into one another and creating this this third interstitial in between type of um you know sacred time to use Eliad's uh terminology and yeah absolutely it it is one that one has to cultivate and 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 work towards in order to achieve um sometimes it happens spontaneously you know sometimes it can just be one of those lightning bolt moments where you're going about your day and suddenly you you're immersed in it and that's that that's absolutely authentic in my view however it's it is when we undertake the the practice or the process to to create arenas where that sacred time can manifest uh, where we kind of invite the ancient invite the, you know the dead invite that which is the, the spectral into the present that one can truly and fully experience that again kind of like the my notion of following one's fear to have this more considered cultivation of sacred horror which is a which is a, a wiser form of of seeking one's fear and working with one's fear it's the same type of thing here it's creating those arenas where those moments of sacred time can express themselves could you define or, or kind of hint at uh, some kind of experience where modern like a contemporary person could experience this kind of to get a kind of taste of sacred horror in in the contemporary world what would he be the right environment for this what would one have to, has to do in order to get into this kind of headspace at least to get some kind of taste of it if not the true uh, total experience sure i think that the the most direct way and and you know really one of the simplest ways is to venture past you know your your known environment preferably somewhere solitarily somewhere that's you know uh, a, a bit eerie something that has that sense of you know it doesn't even have to be a, a sort of dark or frightening place but something where a person gets that sense of the eternal and venture there alone at night is best if you can and then invoke something call something up speak what comes to your mind you know ask that place or that aspect of yourself however you want to begin it whatever um whatever sort of construct works best for you in that point because as i've often said to people whether one wants to believe that these spirits are external presences that they are simply witnessing or whether they want to have the them be figures of their own subconscious that work in um in ways that seem other but are really just aspects of self to me it's 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 moot you know it's it that that kind of those are the kinds of the wrong questions to ask it's follow that sense of what what is other to you and ask what you can do how can you serve them can they show you the next step it give you a sign and from and and just be open to however that may manifest it could be some an object that you find on your on, on the path on your way out it could be something that you know occurs in that moment it could be a dream that you have you know a few nights later but follow that through and continue to pursue it finding those places and those um activities that are uncomfortable and unsettling that is really what is going to begin to lessen that stranglehold of self of of the apollonian intellect and is going to begin really allowing the dionysian soul to flourish that was great i i couldn't have asked for better instructions 
to experience or at least uh, begin to experience this kind of phenomenon it brings to my mind this is this is quite advanced i would say and uh, not not something you should uh, try at home so to speak <laughs> if if, no, if you don't have a prior experience or or education so to speak but the uh, divine madness i think it was called teia mania mm-hmm. uh, in the in the greece back back in the days and uh, of course it seems to be related to the ecstasy and i know that you know the etymology of the word ecstasy but could you could you speak a bit about this how the ecstasy term has changed over the years sure what did it originally mean because i think i know this is important to your work too it is it is you know ecstasy has its roots in the ancient greek term ecstasis yes and what that meant was a it was a very specific term referring to a spiritual phenomenon specifically when one's subtle body or shadow self or double their eidolon there were different terms for it but it was basically that spiritual subtle aspect of self would separate from the physical body sometimes this would occur during ritual sometimes it would occur in dream and often the eidolon or one's double would undertake a kind of independent exploration gathering information or experience that would then come back and once again integrate reintegrate back into the self once the spiritual body returned now today ecstasy is of course related to to pleasure or to you know states of intense excitement you know and and emotionally there is there's some resonance with that i don't want to completely discount that but where it is related to the to the roots of it is to get back to that notion of working with a subtle body and this can happen through through trance through dream techniques provided one you know undertakes the the work required to learn how to do them but it is a way to have a direct link to that spiritual world to that netherworld um and this is this is a very important aspect of this kind of work because it is what that is what gives one agency that is what enables one to work with the spirits of of that particular of of the spirit realm because they have this spiritual double that has a certain degree of autonomy that does understand the you know the workings of that kind of subtle plane of being so the activation and and separation of and eventual reintegration of one's eidolon with the physical body is where this is the ecstasis is a technique or or spiritual technology that is as viable today as it was in in ancient greece it brings to my mind for example i don't know if it's a sufi uh, sect but the dervishes they have this uh, spiral dance they are mm-hmm. spinning in uh, in order to achieve this kind of trance state and i believe in world mythologies there are many examples of of this kind of practices where one could get beside themselves and maybe ecstasy is the key to the straight jacket of of rationalism yes yeah definitely there's still a couple of um, interesting uh, themes we are going to really dive deep into the next episode but you have of course referred many times to the kata basis uh, could you give a brief explanation for that because i'm i'm trying to give, have this uh, collection of people's different views on the same topics because i can kind of uh, get more broader view what's your view and importance of kata basis what does it mean to you well as opposed to we were talking earlier about the notion of of transcendent yes the catabasis or catabasis is it's a descent it is a descent into the depths or the netherworld and this is where i see it as connected on many levels to the work that i do um in a mythological sense or or a sort of grander mythic sense it is 
the literal descent of one into the realm of the dead, into the kingdom of Hades in ancient Greece. It can also be the descent into oneself, into the mechanisms of the subconscious and allowing that expression. It can also be when one wishes to engage with the depth or the, the soul of their own environment. And this leads to the flourishing of demonic reality. So it is a, it is really a means to experience the thing in its wholeness. It is both soul and form. So it is the, the inner significance of the thing as well as its outer expression. And the reason why this is such a vitally important process is because it allows one to comprehend the significance of these things. You know, we've talked about why certain images in, in our childhoods, let's say, from, from the horror genre have been important. Well, to take those at a superficial level, it can it would basically be possibly dismissed as these are just my aesthetics. I just like this stuff and you know, it's fun. Well, that's that's fine. On a certain level, that's you know, that's acceptable. But to pursue it more deeply, to really delve, to descend into the underlying significance of these things. Well, then that is where it begins to show how it is connected to deeper traditions, to other modes of, of being, to certain philosophies, to how it connects to other cultures. And suddenly you're enmeshed in this depth that was beneath the surface, that was underneath the apparent. And that comes through that willing and considered descent into the netherworld. Thank you. Let's move on to the Moonstrom. Uh, that is another topic I, I'm sure you are well, very well versed in. And I believe Moonstrom is what waits you at the end of the catapaces. Do you agree? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, it's it's in in that sense, it's it's similar to you know the Minotaur that that yes. Theseus faces at at the end of the labyrinth. So that the the Monstrum, which of course is also the root of our, our term monster is a great model to illustrate that the the monstrous the 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 overwhelmingly horrific and the awesome is also a vessel for these profound spiritual truths and there is there is a a sacredness in in their extreme otherness the, the monstrum offers this perfect emblem that can overwhelm one and and palpably in, you know imprints them with the reality of, of these types of concepts so it's it is not really an, an abstract pleasing um, kind of intellectual puzzle that one works through and then they understand the the meanings behind a lot of these metaphysical things it's it's an it's an arresting immediate palpable visceral encounter with something that really has a face and a form and um is completely paradoxical again there's the there's that fear of of the monstrous but also the acknowledgement that there's something miraculous about them you know it, they're they're horrific and beautiful it's it's like the gorgon there's there's the desire and the dread at once and that's that's where the monstrous in general can can really have that enduring appeal maybe we all have monstrum inside of us and i think the hero's journey uh, which is many times at the movies and the books and i think maybe it was um Oh, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Yes, mm -hmm. he, he was a he propagated this this uh, ancient myth many times, and I think uh, when the hero embarks on the catabases, he kind of confronts and fights the monster in the, at the heart of darkness, so to speak. And normally, it is seen that the hero slays the monster and uh, he rises from the cave, like in, in anabases. And uh, he embarks victorious, so to speak. But maybe 
it's not a fight, but it's it's the hero integrates the monster, and the, what comes up is the hero and the monster. Do yeah. you? Yeah, I would yeah, say that yeah, that's yeah. yeah. The idea of kind of slaying or overcoming the monster is is you know really not one that that I hold with ra simply because it's it's my view that you know all things carry a trace of their own opposite, and yes. that which that which is most most other to us is deeply connected to us. So it's for me less about confronting and overcoming or conquering, and more engaging with you know what what does one what does the monster say to us you know what does this particular uh particularized mythological creature what is it saying about our ourselves what can we learn from this um are we allowing it to express itself to be exercised or is it something that we're simply ignoring and denying so these are the kinds of things that i think um are are a much subtler and um but but nevertheless i suppose a, a healthier if you want to use that term um approach because it's really again allowing that thing that other to express itself rather than to deny confront or attempt to overcome it like reconciling the Jungian shadow or integrating it but i yes. think it really goes much deeper than is normally perceived in the in the modern world we are nearing the end of our interview but i would like to still talk a bit about your latest non-fiction book which is also from Theon. it's called the infernal masquerade could you introduce this book to our listeners yes definitely so the, about, the, yeah. yes the infernal mask was the latest release it just came out uh last summer and it's it is a, in many respects, a continuation of the benighted path. Its scope is is narrower, but but deeper, and it's exploring really the the whole notion of uh, working with the one's own death, with also exploring the the nether world as I've talked about it here today, and, and engaging with that. And there's also a, a lot of work with one's eidolon. So it's essentially a, a means of working within that paradoxical dance of, of the dawning of masks and, and the revealing of masks, the way that what one what, what is veiled also, what is chosen to obscure, can also reveal. So there's ex explorations of that and the concept of the underworld in general is explored specifically um, moving into areas of, of more Greek mythology and kind of unpacking that. It also deals with the um, Chaldean oracles. I talk a lot about the breaking down certain sections of the Chaldean oracles of Zoroaster and how that relates to Catabasis and where that process can go in relation to fortifying and understanding one's own Eidolon and having that ecstasis and how does one draw further meaning? How does one work with their Eidolon in, in these types of environments, which are wholly other to us, the environments that the conscious self would be utterly bewildered by. So these are some of the things that I discuss in the new book. Um, so far, I've, you know, I've been very pleased with the, um, response that I've gotten from readers. They seem to be resonating a lot with it. It's, as I said, it's, it's, it's focus is not quite as broad as, as the benighted path, because I'm now getting into more specific examples that I'm ex exploring a little bit more fully that also involve practice. So there's, there's discussion. You mentioned scrying earlier. I talk a lot in, in the new book about scrying processes and how these are ways that we can work with that kind of grammar of the netherworld. That sounds absolutely amazing. There is one certain phrase or topic, it's called the gloom of Erebus. Mm -hmm. uh, could you just briefly explain what this was? Because I, I found it fascinating. Yep, yeah, certainly. It's, well, Erebus, the gloom of Erebus goes back to, again, an ancient Greek um, mythological principle and it was basically a form of kind of 
living darkness or 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 mist that would overtake certain environments and when that happens there's a kind of bleeding in of the netherworld there's this is the moment when the certainty of the forms of one's physical environment become obscured by a fog a mist or you know a, a kind of darkness that then becomes imbued or populated with spirits and this has been a phenomenon that i've experienced myself in my own spiritual work and what was gratifying about the chapter is i was able to pull from different mythological as well as literary examples as of how this phenomenon occurs which is again like some of the other concepts we've talked about was something i hadn't really seen addressed in other esoteric literature and i was able to explore it in and also offer my own take on the significance of it i see thank you for the explanation now we are concluding this interview and it will continue in the part two in it i promise we will dive deep into the very heart of the metaphysical thread and encounter the king fear himself so stay tuned and good night